it's very nice to be here at Dargis, Sydney, dealing with the most bright and special audience in the entire world. Actually, it's funny about audiences. Um, I think that we who did Lord of the Rings have a brighter fan base than any other fan base that I've ever met. And if you think about it, it is because most of the people who saw the film had read the book before they went. And those who hadn't read the book afterwards. And the book is that thick. And it sort of acts as a, an enormous selector of intelligence, doesn't it, really? So if you've seen the film and actually read the book, you must be extraordinarily bright. I have to confess that before I did the film, I hadn't read the book, which probably tells you something about me, too. Um, anyway, since this is an Armageddon, Festival, and since we're talking about science fiction and science fantasy, I want to sort of pass on one or two reflections before we actually get on to, you know, uh, Orlando Bloom's telephone number and all the other things that you're really here for. Um, I read the other day about something called Toxoplasma Gondi. Toxoplasma gondii is a, a parasite. It spends half its life in the stomach of a cat. And part of its reproductive cycle is there. Then, of course, all those little eggs that it hatches are excreted. And they're eaten by a rat. And the other half of its reproductive cycle happens in the rat. Now, it has to get back into a cat in order to continue. So what it does, it modifies the behavior of the rat. It, it changes the way that a rat fears the cat. Cats do not frighten infected rats. In fact, rats are attracted to the smell of cats. So the infected rat runs up to a cat and is properly killed and eaten and the bacterium continues its cycle in the cat. Now why am I so interested in this? Well, it turns out that Toxoplasma gondii also infects other mammals, including human beings. And it just so happens that if you are infected with Toxoplasma gondii, you are five times more likely to have an accident in a car. I was wondering whether other forms of risky behavior could be attributed to bacterial or parasitic infections. Perhaps, in fact, we are all the victims of these strange things. Uh, there is now a belief, for instance, that some parasites, including the, the parasites inside our guts, may be far more active in making us who we are. There is a belief, for instance, that obesity may be controlled by the type of parasites that you have in your guts. There is an awful theory which will make you really wrinkle your nose up in disgust that the, one of the ways that we should treat things like arthritis, one of the ways we should try to prevent Alzheimer's, is by removing the, the bacterium that we have in our guts and replacing it with somebody else's from their bottom too. It's called a fecal transplant. Those of you who don't know what FCR should look at the dictionary. <laughs> I only say this because you are all so young that you will probably live to the end of the century. 
and by the end of the century, medical advances should have given you the opportunity to renew many of your little bits and pieces. I anticipate that by the end of the century, you will go to the doctor and say, well, doctor, is it serious? And you'll say, yes, I'm afraid it is. It is a cancer. And you'll say, oh, damn. And I booked my Christmas holiday in Hawaii. And you'll say, well, I know we haven't got much time, but we are growing a new kidney and liver for you, even as we speak. And we might be, we might just manage to get it in before your holiday you're going to be able to replace parts that will come from your own body and effectively if you can survive to the last years of this century i think there is just a possibility that you could live almost almost forever but when you know that you can live that long how your attitude is going to change to other things, to all those random things. How you're going to hate news that somebody got murdered. How you're going to hate the news that somebody got run over by a car. That would be really scary, wouldn't it? I can live forever, unless an accident happens. And your whole life will change as you start worrying about little random accidents. And I shall be laughing from somewhere because, of course, I shall be here, but I shall be watching. <laughs> anyway, anyone got any other reflections to make? Yes, I am a sick old man, and it's probably the onset of dementia or something like that. Um, Anyone got any questions? Uh, anyone been to the to films? Any, anyone seen any film, good films lately? What, what? Never heard of it. Uh, I really should be more up to date with, uh, with all these things. I, I'm actually a member of the, uh, the Motion Picture Academy, which awards Academy Awards, and I have to confess I haven't been to the movies this year yet. I have to do a lot of sitting in aeroplanes, aren't I, or something like that, quickly catching up on things. Anyway, um, does anyone have a microphone? Yeah, yes. Come on up here, give this young man a microphone. Hi, John, how you going, mate? I was very um, fortunate to meet you. I want to ask you, you've worked with many different directors, um, Steven Spielberg, obviously, George Lucas, and Peter Jackson. Which was the most, uh, out of the three you've worked with, which was the most favourite you've worked with? Well, I never personally worked with Lucas as a director. He was producer of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I, I can't honestly speak as an actor about him. As a, as a member of the audience, um, his has been an extraordinary career, isn't it? Because he sort of, he showed such extraordinary brilliance earlier on. And then he resolved to try and develop the technical side of the industry. Uh, and yet, when he came back, I don't really think that the Star Wars films are as wonderful as, uh, as I think he thought that they would be. Um, I love the early Star Wars films. I'm not quite sure, but I really love the later ones. Sorry, I didn't realize that was a... I, I, I thought you'd all be going, ooh. Um, Steven Spielberg is a genius. Um, Steven can tell a story through pictures, I think, better than any, any filmmaker has ever done. There's a, a scene in the first Jurassic Park where the coach is falling and the people are moving through it, being attached to a rope, that I think is just the most brilliant piece of imagining, visually imagining, that sort of action that I think I've ever seen. Um, I mean, he is just a great, great filmmaker. 
and then of course there's Peter Jackson, who is a different type of filmmaker, and yet I think between the two of them, they are they're they're they're, they're real they're two real giants in the history of film. Del Toro, who was meant to be um, directing The Hobbit, and, and whom I had the privilege of meeting, uh, I think he's a fantastic filmmaker as well. There are so many hugely well-equipped directors uh, these days. Uh, if you're going to try and get me to say which is the better, uh, I, I really can't. They have different strengths. Uh, all I can say is that I didn't believe that Peter Jackson understood what on earth he was trying to do when he decided he was going to film Lord of the Rings. It's unfilmable. Um, I went there as a complete skeptic. I did not believe that those films were possible. Uh, why did I do it? I didn't want to play Gimli. I didn't want to spend 18 months of my life in a nasty little prosthetic um, to make a film that failed at the box office and two more that might just have gone direct to DVD. I didn't want to waste that much time in my life. And this little chap in New Zealand, who, I mean, what's he done? He's done a couple of little films and they're very good. Maybe four or five, but anyone can direct a film uh, that has four characters in it and shoot it over six weeks. Unfortunately, they do do it all the time. Um, so I was very skeptical. And my agent said, John, if you do not accept this part, I'm afraid we can't continue to represent you anymore. And my number one son, Ben, said, Dad, forgive me, I think you're nuts to turn this down. And I said, why? And he said, because if you think about it, in every bookshop in the world, there's two foot of book space devoted to Tolkien. Just think of what that means in terms of the fan base. And that has sort of impressed me. So I said, yes, I'd do it, but I have to tell you, I didn't mean it. I thought, I'll go to New Zealand and satisfy myself that this is just preposterous. He can't know what it takes to make a film like this. And so for two weeks, every morning and every afternoon, I would go into every department and I would sit and talk to people and they would excitedly show me the costume designs, the, the set designs, the motion camera, motion, pic, um, motion capture camera stuff, the, 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 the lenses, the everything. I went into every department because I knew that there couldn't possibly be a place in New Zealand that knew how to make this film. And in every department, I found a level of expertise that I would only expect to find in LA, London, Rome perhaps, possibly Paris. Uh, I don't know about the China and Japan and places like that, but um, just a level of filmmaking expertise. And I realized that this funny little chap who wandered around in shorts all the time, actually had created an entire film industry to serve